Um, I want to say a very big thank you for making time out of your very busy schedules to attend this event. It shows that you're very, very dedicated to a successful career. I am Danny Sarui, the president and founder of the Finance Society. We thought that as a specialist business school, um, it had been great for us to set up a society. I would like to say a very big thank you to the committee members, to the university management, the careers team, and everyone else who has made sure that today is a reality. At this moment, I'll pass you on to our co-founder and treasurer, Moses Iwanji. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Moses, co-founder and treasurer of the GSM London Finance Society. The reason for this Skills and Employability Seminar is that as a society we found it pertinent for students to understand the specific skills and attributes we need to get into our chosen careers. This is why we invited seasoned professionals from different fields encompassing finance and academia in order to give us valuable insights into what is required. These days, degrees graduates are very commonplace and with the advancement of globalization, we are no longer competing with people in our respective country. We are now competing with them globally. Therefore, we need to distinguish ourselves from the rest of the competition. And this is one of the key reasons why we are holding this seminar today. I will now be handing over to Mohammed, another committee member, who will be introducing the guest speakers for today. Thank you. Okay, um, firstly, could I please invite Mr. Andrew Falconer. He's going to give us an introductory speech speech to the seminar today, please. Thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon. My name is Andrew Faulkner, and I'm Director of Careers and Employability with GSM London. Um, I'd like to again uh, thank you all for coming, and particularly for our speakers who have given um, quite a lot of time this afternoon to help you understand what it is they do and where you might fit into that within your own career paths. But also, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the GSM London Finance Society. I've only been in post for four weeks. I'm new. You guys know this place better than I do. It's a bit scary, isn't it? Um, and on my second day, I met GSM London Finance Society. And they blew me away. Because they got, these guys have put in so much effort into organizing this event. Um, the attention to detail has been absolutely superb. So why are you here? Well, 40 years ago, when the Greenwich School of Management was founded, since 40 years ago, about 20,000 students have graduated. 20,000. And you're part of that. You're part of that history, that legacy, that, 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 that's going forward. And nowadays, it's even more important to have a degree in professional qualification of some sort. Last year, for the first time, the number of entry-level jobs that don't do require a degree was less than those that do, for the first time ever. So having a degree has become increasingly important. So you, you guys are definitely in the right place. Have a look at this picture. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. In the 80s and 90s, shoulder pads, Dallas on TV, the original Dallas. That was what the impression I got of what a networking event might be like. It's a little bit scary. Has anybody ever seen a really good networker? Sometimes you'll see somebody in the room who just knows, seems to know instinctively how to do this. But actually, networking is something which we can all learn, and actually we all need to learn. Which of these do you think equates to the number of graduates who've got their first job through somebody they know? 43%? Hands up for 43%. Okay, so 43% of graduates get their first job through somebody they know. Anybody for 24%? Handful, yeah, 16? 9? Okay. Thankfully, it's not 43%. And also, thankfully, it's not 9%. 9% is actually 
typically the number of graduates who will go into what's known as a graduate scheme. So all the big recruiters uh, campaigns, all the big career fairs you go to, about 9% of all graduates will go into those schemes. Roughly a quarter, 25%, will get their first job through somebody they know. Now this is not somebody they know giving them a job, okay? That is not what this is about. This is somebody they know giving them enough information to get their first job. And that's different. And networking is actually about that. It's about thinking about building up your contacts, not necessarily they're going to give you a job, but they will give you information that will help you. And that's about developing what's known as commercial awareness, and is incredibly important. So after this event, you'll be relieved to know that there was some lovely, lovely, lovely food in the woolly room. Woolly? Something? Yep. One of those rooms along the card. You'll find it. You'll smell the food. Um, and you should have the chance then to speak to these um, great speakers and to actually begin to understand, again, a little bit more about what they do and how, how, how it might relate to you. So what should you ask them? Any, any ideas? How about, yeah? <laughs> Would you give me a job? <laughs> now, before you guys panic, this is what's going through their head. Yes, I will absolutely put my professional reputation on the line to give a job to a complete stranger. Okay? The chances are very, very, very low that you're going to get a job by asking somebody outright to give me a job, quite like that. So this is about keeping your expectations level, okay? These guys, you're off the hook, okay? So what can you get from them? Information and advice, okay? And when we do training sessions in the career service, DSM careers on networking, we look at this in, in a lot more detail. Information, is actually about the role itself. What do you do? What does what actually being an accountant mean? Um, yeah, how do you spend your day? What are the promotional prospects like? Advice is much more pertinent to you. It's about, I'm doing this course, what advice would you give me? So can you take one person on? So information is about um, the job, the sector, building your knowledge. Advice might be slightly more specific to you. In a networking session like today, in reality, information is probably where you're going to find uh, the conversation tends to sit. And that's fine. For those of you who are nervous about networking, it's okay, it's understandable. I'm passing around a, a handout with some good starter questions. You, okay? Um, it might just give you some idea of how you might enter into a conversation with somebody you haven't met before like that. Okay? So I just wanted to, to wrap up my short slot by saying um, have a fantastic afternoon. Okay? You're going to hear an awful lot, get lot, an awful lot of information from this afternoon. If you're trying to decide what to do with that information and how it relates to you as an individual, come and see us in the Career Centre. We are in the LRC on the first floor. Um, we can provide one-to-one -one appointments. We do help, so help with psychometric testing, application CVs, pretty much everything. And we're also on all the social networks, so LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, I'm very, very active on those too. So if you haven't already joined us on those networks, we have posters around the room and around the corridors, so just scan in QR codes and you'll find us there. Thank you very much, and I wish you the best success. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, our next guest that we will be uh, next guest that will be invited to the stage is a director, market issuer, risk manager for International Treasury Desk. He works for Bank of America Maryland and he's been there for 41 years. 
The topic you'll be talking about today is an insight on risk. So could I please invite Mr. Philip Seeger to the stage, please. My name is, as I was introduced, my name is Phil Seeger. Uh, I've worked for Bank of America for a very long time, uh, nearly 42 years now. So I'm actually older than the Greenwich School of Management. <laughs> um, uh, Moses was very generous in saying that I was a seasoned professional, or maybe it was just described as sort of a general seasoned professional. I think what he really meant was that I'm an old professional. Uh, so I'm at the end of my career, effectively. Uh, but I'm still enjoying working in the industry I do, which is banking. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Bank of America and my role in it. Uh, bank of America is an international bank. It's a world bank. It covers the full range of banking services. So it does everything that you would expect a retail, or a commercial, or a wholesale, or an international bank to do. So, you know, typically we do we do the bread and butter stuff in the States, which is a large part of our income is taking deposits from depositors and lending it to people like homeowners to buy for mortgages and to buy cars and all the rest of that stuff. So we do all that very basic that banking stuff and that's a very big part of our business. Uh, but we also do all the other stuff uh, involved like making commercial loans to companies so that companies can continue to work, they have working capital and we provide, we work with them for their financing needs. So if they want a loan and they're a good credit then we give them a loan. If you know that if they need to raise money by issuing securities, then we'll arrange that securities issuance for whichever is the best way to suit the customer. In doing that, we take fees, we take spreads, etc., which make the return for us reasonable. Uh, we also do all the normal stuff you expect of big international banks, big global banks. We do mergers and acquisitions where we advise on the purchase and sale of companies and what, what companies might well be merged and benefits for shareholders. And, uh, we do trading in terms of uh, running an investment bank, where we trade in fixed income markets, the equities markets, the foreign exchange markets, and the credit markets generally. And when I say trade, I have to be a little bit careful these days, because trade is, after the 2000 credit and currency crisis, trade is a little bit of a dirty word. Uh, what we do is we have positions in these markets. And typically, the way that we have these positions these days is we have them in terms of building customer inventory. Uh, so what you used to have in banking, and again, it's a dirty word these days in, in many US banks, is proprietary trading. But what a bank would do is go out and bet its own capital in order to make money by taking out our positions. That now is kind of outlawed under the new US regulations for the crisis. So we typically don't do that type of activity in the type of banking world, nor do the other big internet banks. Um, but let me just, again, describe a little bit about risk, about what a bank actually does. Banks make money by taking risk. That's, that's what we do, that's our function. If we didn't take risk, our returns would be very poor, and it probably wouldn't be worth running the business. So you've got to get used to the concept that banks like taking risk. That's what we do. And it's managing that risk and mitigating that risk uh, so that the shareholder gets a reasonable return and gets a reasonably safe return. That's what a bank does. That's its core function. I mean, we could, if we wanted, just take deposits from customers on one side, um, pay them a rate, <coughs> lend it for them to buy a, a house or a car, take a small spread in between, so we lend it at a slightly higher rate, take a small spread or margin in between. That margin isn't enough to cover the cost of our capital. So that isn't that doesn't give us a reasonable return that we need to get in order to be economically viable. So we need to get more from it, and that's what banks do. Banks do that simple business, but then take additional risk in order to increment that basic income. Um, my particular world is in the treasury world. So again, it's the core function of a bank. If you look at a treasury operation in a bank, what you have is the operation that says, can, this is right down to the basics, can we finance ourselves? We're making loans here, we're making to customers, we're making to corporations, we're making them by taking uh, trading positions. Positions. Uh, we need to finance these by having the cash to finance them. Can we do that? And that's the core function of the bank. That's what all banks do, whether it's Barclays or, or HSBC or Bank of America or the smallest bank you see on the high street. All banks have that core basic function. And that's the world I live in. Um, where we, our main function is to make sure that the bank is liquid that we always enough, have enough cash on hand to cover 
our requirements, our obligations. So that, that's the kind of world that I work in, the very, very conservative part. Um, again, it's not the sexy investment type banking that you read about in the newspapers. Um, it's not the retail bank in the US. It, it's the core treasury function of making sure that the cash flow works. And as many of you will find, will find out, find if you go into any form of business, whether it's a bank or whether it's, uh, you set up your own companies, private company, um, cash flow is the single most important thing. So, you know, you can be making, just as a very, let me step aside, as a company or as an individual, you can very easily make profit. You know, assuming you've got your calculations right, you've got your business model right, etc., and the economics right, making a profit can come reasonably straightforwardly. Many companies, and the majority of companies that go bankrupt, they not go bankrupt because they're not making a profit. They're making profits. What they go bankrupt, or well, the reason they go bankrupt, is effectively that they can't finance their bills. So they're getting the bills coming in for the electricity, from their supplies, invoices, etc., uh, for the payments of their salaries. When they come to the end of the month and they try and meet these bills, they can't meet them. If you can't meet your cash bills, if, you can't, if your current account is in deficit, and you can't get an overdraft, you're busted. You may be making a very healthy PL, but you're still busted out of business. So managing cash flow is inherent to any activity, any business activity that you'll be engaged in. It's probably the single most important activity in managing business. So, and that's what my world does, is it looks after those cash flows. But I actually work for the risk organisation. And so, as you can guess, by working for the risk organisation, my role is to look at the risk you run and say, can I quantify that risk? So can I convert that risk that we run into metrics that people will understand and that will allow us to say whether the risk we run is reasonable? Um, and we can then mitigate that risk by hedging it or taking offsetting positions or offloading the positions to somebody else. Uh, and we can report it so we can make sure everybody's aware of the risk, that nobody's blindsided by a risk that's been taken that's unknown. You know, that's the very worst situation you can get into in the bank, is when suddenly out of left field, you get an event that completely blindsides you. It blindsides you not because it's, it may be completely sudden and you weren't expecting it, but it blindsided you as well because you haven't prepared for it. You should have prepared for it and you haven't prepared for it. So, in the risk organisation, we, we tend to categorise its risks in, 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 in many ways. There's many different types of risks. So if I just go through some of the basic types of risks, so, for example, let me just read out a list of the risks to you, and you'll get an idea of the confidence and nature of them. So we have strategic risk, credit risk, market risk, liquidity risk, operational risk, compliance risk, and reputational risk, all of which are managed by teams of professionals. Now, my actual role is to look after market risk and issue risk. So that I have two of those entities in, in the Treasury world. And, you know, my group, let's say, in, in, I look after our risk in Asia, uh, Europe, Latin America and Canada. And we have maybe three people working on it. So we have a very small team. Reasonable amount of risk, but a very small team working on it. If I look at our global markets business, which is uh, what people would describe as the investment banking part of the business, then that has multiple numbers of people. So it's a much bigger operation. They have much bigger risks and exposures to manage. They employ numbers. You know, if you looked at our risk organization in total in Bank of America, it runs into the thousands of people. Uh, and that has ramped up extremely fast from 2007 with the credit crisis and the liquidity crisis because banks realised, regulators realised, politicians realised that banks weren't doing their jobs to work in this world. So, you know, you've seen a lot of redundancies in the banking industry over the last five years, although it's turning around now. But where you never saw redundancies was in the risk area. You know, there were no redundancies in risk, uh, whether it was market risk or issuer risk or compliance risk. Those areas they're in more demand than they were in 2007, simply because the banks did such a bad job prior to that of managing risk. So, you know, the regulators have come to us and said, if you want to carry on doing business, you've got to manage that bit and that risk more effectively. You've got to show us that you can manage it properly. And one of the ways, of course, you do that is by hiring more people to get more metrics, to get more confidence that the numbers that you're producing and the risk evaluation that you're doing is good. So, you know, our industry has been a growth industry. If you looked at what we, the number of people we employed in risk in London in 2007 compared to today, it's probably gone up by 75% of them. 